take your Bibles, if you will, and open up to the book of Daniel, chapter 2, and put a marker here if you don't have it there already. Daniel and his three friends have shown us what godly manhood, godly womanhood looks like. To summarize it, we could say this, that godly manhood, godly womanhood is courage and conviction instead of compromise. It is faith instead of fear. It is action instead of reaction. It is prayer and patience instead of panic. And it is glorifying God rather than glorifying self. Those are some good ways that we have seen Daniel display godly manhood. Uh, As we think about this tonight, I want us to return to Daniel chapter 2, verses 48 and 49. And in those scriptures, the Bible said, Then the king made Daniel a great man and gave him many great gifts and made him ruler over the whole province of Babylon and chief of the governors over all the wise men of Babylon. And then Daniel requested of the king, and he set Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego over the affairs of the province of Babylon. But Daniel sat in the gate of the king. If we were to put this all in our vernacular for today, Daniel received many gifts. He is now made the head governor or the prime minister over the capital city and the chief province of Babylon. He is the chief governor over all the governors who were in charge of the wise men, all the counselors. Daniel, the Bible says, sat in the chief gate of the city. It was a a position of prestige. It was a position of authority. And he would have been second only to the king. And Daniel then requested that his friends would be made Uh, We could maybe say deputy governors or lieutenant governors among the provinces. Things are really looking up and going great. This is the highest mountain peak so far that Daniel has been on. But look out, what's coming? Mountain goat's coming, and it's going to topple him right off of that mountain. Now, as we look at this tonight, chapter 3, and the first six verses, we see a proud king. A proud king, Nebuchadnezzar the king, made an image of gold, whose height was three score cubits and the breadth thereof six cubits, and he set it up in the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon. Then Nebuchadnezzar the king sent to gather together the princes, the governors, the captains, the judges, the treasurers, the counselors, the sheriffs, and all the rulers of the provinces to come to the dedication of the image which Nebuchadnezzar the king had set up. Then the princes, the governors, the captains, the judges, the treasurers, the counselors, the sheriffs, and all the rulers of the provinces were gathered together unto the dedication of the image that Nebuchadnezzar the king had set up, and they stood before the image that Nebuchadnezzar had set up. Then a herald cried aloud, To you it is commanded, O people, nations, and languages, that at what time ye hear the sound of the cornet, the flute, the harp, the sackbut, the psaltery, the dulcimer, and all kinds of music, Ye fall down and worship the golden image that Nebuchadnezzar the king hath set up. And whoso falleth not down and worshipeth shall the same hour be cast in the midst of a burning, fiery furnace. A proud king. If you remember from Nebuchadnezzar's dream, in that dream, Nebuchadnezzar was the head of gold. Just the head. Everything else under it was a different metal composition. And so here we go, Nebuchadnezzar says, let's just make an entire statue all out of gold. This guy is a proud individual. Kind of a spoiler alert, when we get into Daniel chapter 4, we are going to see how God absolutely drops this proud king because of this pride that he has. But take a look with me in Proverbs chapter 16. Proverbs chapter 16, and this is something, folks, that we desperately must guard against in our own lives. Proverbs chapter 16, in verse 5. Proverbs 16, in verse 5, the Bible says, Everyone that is proud in heart is an abomination to the Lord. Though hand join in hand, he shall not be unpunished. Jump to verse 18. Pride goeth before destruction, and a haughty spirit before a fall. Jump over to chapter 18 and look at verse 12. Chapter 18 and verse 12. The Bible says, Before destruction, the heart of a man is haughty, and before honor is humility. This king is a man that has no honor because he has no humility. 
When we look at pride and we recognize just how dangerous, dangerous and devastating it can be, we are reminded in 1 Corinthians chapter 10 when the Bible says, Wherefore let him that thinketh he standeth take heed. Why? Lest he fall. Proverbs is loaded with warnings all the way throughout the Bible against pride and against arrogance. Again, how do we defeat pride and arrogance in our life? By making sure that we don't take a pinch of glory for ourselves. We always return it back to God. This is a proud king. But let's look in Daniel chapter 3 and verse 7 and notice something. This is also a pliable nation. This is a pliable nation. The Bible says in verse 7 again, Therefore that at the time when all the people heard the sound of all the instruments, all kinds of music, that all the people, the nations and the languages, fell down and worshipped the golden image that Nebuchadnezzar the king had set up. When I read this, I notice that the Bible uses the word all. All the people heard, all the people, the nations and languages, fell down and worshipped the golden image. I believe what the Bible says. If God had not meant all, God wouldn't have put all. So we know that there are three who did not bow. And you say, well, what about Daniel? Do you think Daniel bowed? Not in the least do I think that Daniel bowed. And you say, well, then why isn't Daniel mentioned as one of those who didn't bow? Uh, I'll get to that in just a minute, but I do think there is a reason. Even though all these people bow, it made me ask a question. Do you think that all the people wanted to bow? There's a difference between them all doing it and all of them wanting to do it. The Bible says they all did, but did they all want to? Do you think some did it just out of fear? Do you think others did it just because another family member told them, hey, you better do this? Okay, well, my family member said so, so I guess I will. This would have included the Jews who were in captivity. Did they do it because they feared Belteshazzar or Nebuchadnezzar? Did they do it because of that? Had they been so assimilated into the Babylonian culture that as they were told to do this, it's like, oh, well, yeah, this is what we have to do because this is our culture. How many bowed just because everybody else was doing it? I mean, think about that. That's a powerful argument. Anybody here that's a parent You've had the exact same excuse brought home to you by your child that wanted to do something. And they have said, well, everybody else is doing it. And what was your response as a parent? Well, if everybody else jumped off a bridge, would you do it too? That's the traditional response to that. Everybody's doing it. So you've got to wonder how many of these people did it because everybody else was doing it. You know what's lacking in, in, in a culture like this and what's lacking in our culture as well? Common sense. You don't do something just because everybody else is doing it. You don't become pliable because a government said so. And that's right where we're at today. Thomas Jefferson said this many years ago. He says, when the people fear the government, there is tyranny. When the government fears the people, there is liberty. Edward Murrow wrote this, a nation of sheep will beget a government of wolves. Let's take our mind back to Nebuchadnezzar and Babylon. Those people were sheep. Those people bowed. They bowed out of fear. They bowed out of coercion. They bowed because everybody else is doing it. And this bunch of sheep beget a government of wolves. 2020 is a year we wish we could forget. May the 13th, 2020, there was a bold piece that was written in the Washington Times. I want to share with you some pieces of this. This is amazing. Think for a moment of how you would have reacted to any pre-COVID-19 idea that the police in America, using not the force of opinion, but the force of arms would prevent you from going out of your home, operating your business, jogging in a park, patronizing a restaurant or clothing store, buying a garden hose, going to church, or even joining a small public gathering of folks who wanted to protest these prohibitions. Americans seem to accept the restrictions on our rights to speech, religion, travel, and commercial activities simply because the origin of the restrictions is a popularly elected person. But even an elected government can be tyrannical. 
Should you bow to these restrictions merely because their authors were elected and they have persuaded your neighbors that the prohibitions are for their own good, the Declaration and the Constitution be hung? Stated differently, the governments that have interfered with our well-established rights to go about our daily lives as we see fit. Taking chances whenever we cross the street, drink a glass of water, bite into food, sit next to a stranger on a train or at a baseball game, or go through a green light in our vehicles, have failed their first obligation, which is to safeguard our freedoms to take those chances. I thought that was a good article. That was a brave article to write. There was a term that came out in 2020. I had never heard it until I studied for this message. Sheeple. I mentioned it, talking to some people Wednesday night, and they go, oh yeah, they'd heard that. I must be living in, in, in the dark like a mushroom, because I'd never heard that until I studied. But sheeple is a term that came out, and it described people who did whatever the government said. Here we are three years later, and we have learned that a lot of the things that the government said to do are dangerous and detrimental and yet the sheeple did whatever they were told to do. I say that to illustrate that what happened in Babylon with Nebuchadnezzar is not any different than what has happened in our world and around the globe, and it's not any different than what is going to happen prophetically. When you look at the Scriptures, the Bible says there is nothing new under the sun. There really isn't, folks. It just gets played out. If you want to know what's coming, you want to know what to do when situations arise, go back to your Bible. And notice what happened way back when, when things were, were forced upon people and when they had to make a choice. They had to make the choice to either stand and be counted and let their voice be heard or to become sheeple. In Acts chapter 4, verse 19. Acts chapter 4, verse 19. This was a pliable nation. Christians, you and I cannot be pliable people. Pliable under the hands of Almighty God, yes. But beyond that, no. Acts chapter 4, verse 19. But Peter and John answered and said unto them, Whether it be right in the sight of God to hearken Unto you more than unto God, judge ye. Jump over to chapter 5, verse 29. Then Peter and the other apostles answered and said, We ought to obey God rather than men. Christians, we need not only common sense, but we need godly sense, or we will become just as pliable as lost people. In 1 Chronicles chapter 12, the Bible says that the children of Issachar which were men that had understanding of the times to know what Israel ought to do. The heads of them were 200, and all their brethren were at their commandment. We are in desperate need today of mature, godly men and women who understand the times and will be able to speak with the voice of common sense, godly sense. And to be able to say and to lead the way that God would want people to go. People that will refuse to bow. Christians, I think this is some of the most uh, practical, some of the most relevant things you could see in Scripture. Because this is the world we are living in. We are watching prophetically as things begin to wind up closer and closer and closer to the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. You say, oh, we've always been in that, that mode, haven't we? Yes, we have, according to Scriptures. But do we not see events heating up? Can we not see what's going on in our world and recognize that the return of Jesus Christ is so much closer than it's ever been? And I mean, it's, it's, it is telling as our world is so ready. Folks, our world is so ready for one government leader. We have a global community already with that kind of a mindset. They want somebody, the people want somebody to tell them what to do. That is sad. When did we check our brains at the door? When did we decide we're just going to bow? 
Christians, you and I, we got to take our stand. We got to take our stand for the Lord. We got to take our stand for, for God's word. I read an article, it was on MSN. And it was talking about, it was a slideshow presentation. It was talking about all the things that Christianity doesn't want people to know. Oh, it was like an expose on Christians and how dangerous we are and how we are so fundamentally uh, wrong in so many different ways and how we are deceptive and deceiving people and all these kinds of things. That is what the world thinks of the church. And it is getting far worse than it's ever been. Have you ever thought that the world would look at, forget the world for a minute, that the United States of America would look at Christians, Christianity, as being the enemy? We are considered dangerous people tonight. How many of you feel dangerous? I'm like, I don't get it. Why are we viewed that way? When all we want to do is tell people that God loves them that Jesus Christ loves them, that they can go to heaven, that there is one way to be saved and only one, and that's Jesus. We don't force it down anybody else's throat. We can't. But we sure can tell people. Oh, but we're a dangerous lot. We're just out there committing acts of violence and all that kind of stuff. That is what the article said. That's how we're being viewed. And the sheeple of the churches across America are saying, oh, we don't want to be viewed that way, so now let's start backing up. Let's start backpedaling. Let's start assimilating into the culture of the world. That is straight out of Daniel's story. And Daniel says, no. Hananiah, Azariah, and Mishael said, no, we're not going to do that. So the third thing tonight is the principled men. Go back to Daniel chapter 3. The principled men... Daniel chapter 3, starting in verse 8. Wherefore, at that time, certain Chaldeans came near and accused the Jews. They spake and said to King Nebuchadnezzar, O king, live forever. Thou, O king, hast made a decree that every man that shall hear the sound of the cornet, flute, harp, sackbut, psaltery, and dulcimer, and all kinds of music shall fall down and worship the golden image. Ain't that right, king? Yep, that's right. And whoso falleth not down and worshipeth, that he should be cast into the midst of a burning fiery furnace. That right, king? Yep, that's right. Well, there are certain Jews whom thou hast set over the affairs of the province of Babylon. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, these men, O king, have not regarded thee. They serve not thy gods, nor worship the golden image which thou hast set up. Again, I ask, why wasn't Daniel mentioned? I don't believe for one second that Daniel had bowed his knee. I think the reason Daniel wasn't mentioned, this comes very, very soon after the king. Remember the king promoted Daniel, or in his mind, he promoted Daniel, and Daniel requested the promotion of his friends. I don't think the Babylonians were quite ready to try to touch Daniel. But let's test the waters, and let's try touching the friends. Because the next big story, we know that it's Daniel. And Daniel finds himself in a lion's den. Because a decree has gone out, don't pray. Unless you're praying to these gods. And Daniel's he's going to pray. And he is going to defy the nation of Babylon. So I really think that's what happened here. We're testing the waters to see. If we can knock these three guys down, Daniel's a piece of cake. Daniel's next. Um, I think the antagonists of the story might be a little bit afraid to go after Daniel. Now, these boys are given the opportunity. These men are given the opportunity. Okay, king says, I'm going to give you one last try. And if you'll bow your knee, you're okay. But if you won't, you're going in the fiery furnace. And they said, we will not bow. Take your Bible, go to James chapter 2. James chapter 2, look at verse 18. In James chapter 2 and verse 18, James writes this, he says, Yea, a man may say, Thou hast faith, and I have works. Show me thy faith without thy works, and I will show thee my faith 
by my works. Hananiah, Azariah, and Mishael are showing their faith by their works. Our works have got to back up our claims to faith. And if our works don't back up our claims to faith, then what claims do we really have? We have got to live out our faith, Christians. And that means living it out in situations like this. This morning we saw Matthew 5, 16. Let your light shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. If we have to take a stand in this world and a stand for the Lord Jesus Christ, we have got to show our faith by our works. Does that mean that it's going to be accepted? Does that mean everybody's going to pat us on the back and say, oh, good job and all that? No. Peter talks about us suffering for the good works. And we're going to suffer, Christians. The day of Christian suffering is coming to America. It really is. And if you sit here tonight and you go, oh, I don't believe that. I don't believe that'll ever come. Get your head out of the sand. It's coming. Why shouldn't it? You know, Christians in every other nation have suffered. And we have had it pretty easy here in America, haven't we? Why shouldn't there come a time where our faith will be put to the test? You say, oh, well, that's going to that's really discourage some people. That's going to destroy some people. It's going to destroy churches. You cannot destroy the Lord's church. You cannot destroy the Lord's church. Oh, you might destroy local churches. You might have individuals say, well, I'm not going anymore, and all this kind of stuff. And, and the heart is going to be revealed. But those who will be true to the Lord are those who are going to be willing to say, I'm taking my stand. That is mature Christianity. I ask each and every one of us tonight, do we have mature Christianity? Uh, just to kind of sum up something about these young men and something that we've got to do, when we have to take our stand, we have to take it with a good and a right attitude. We have to take it without being disrespectful. When you read the words that Hananiah, Ezra, and Mishael spoke to Nebuchadnezzar, they were not disrespectful to him. They just simply asserted, King, we're not going to bow. We can't bow. There's nothing inside of us that can bow because there is only one God and only one God that we will bow our knee to. We have to clearly demonstrate why we're taking our stand. We have to be willing to, uh, to search out the Scripture and to know why we're saying no. That we can't do this. And we have to be able to articulate it. Christians, I, I've said this so many times, we can't wait until the moment to figure out how to articulate our faith. We have got to practice it now. We have got to, in our mind, create some scenarios that maybe we would get put to the test. How are we going to answer that? And to know those scriptures and be ready. We are to be ready always to give an answer to any man that asketh us a reason of the hope that is in us with meekness and fear. We've got to be ready. Tonight, Christian, are you and I ready? Tonight, as we prepare to observe the Lord's table, we are saying in our participation of the Lord's table that we have taken our stand and we take our stand with Jesus Christ. We are saying that we have taken a stand concerning the gospel, concerning the Godhead, concerning the Word of God, concerning separation, concerning our service to the Savior. We are making a public statement as we partake of the Lord's table. Tonight, every one of us could partake of the Lord's table, 100% of us, but the Lord knows our heart. And the Lord knows for whom this is just ceremony, just a, a traditional action that's taken, and for how many this is a true and an honest and a real declaration. I hope tonight, Christians, that our hearts are ready to take of God's table in a true and a ready declaration. If you're here tonight and you don't know the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior, lost person, you have not taken your stand with Jesus you're still standing against him. You say, oh, I believe. I, I've always believed. No, you haven't. At least not unto salvation. You might have always believed facts about the Lord. You might have always believed uh, the Bible stories and things like that. 
but you have not always believed into salvation. There has to have come a point in time in your life where you recognize yourself as a sinner and you would cry out to the Lord Jesus Christ to forgive you and to save your soul. There had to have been that point in your life. And if there hasn't been that point in your life, you don't know Christ as Savior. Whosoever should call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. If you've never called upon Him to be saved, then why do you think you're saved? It's not your family that's getting you to heaven. It's not this church that's getting you to heaven. It's not memorizing Scripture, carrying your Bible to church that's getting you to heaven. It's not giving an offering that gets you to heaven. It's only Jesus. And you either know Him tonight or you don't. And tonight we would love to introduce you to Jesus Christ, the one who wants to save your soul. Stand with me, please, with our heads bowed and our eyes closed. Our Heavenly Father, tonight as we come to this invitation, Lord, you know the need that each and every one of us have in our hearts as believers, first and foremost, Lord. We've got to examine just how ready we are to take our stand, to not be pliable by man, not be pliable by government, not be pliable by culture, but to be pliable only to you and to your word. And Father, tonight we do pray that you would mold us, that you would make us, the men and women of God that we ought to be. Help us to be surrendered to that. But Lord, for that one that may be here tonight without Jesus Christ as Savior, we pray that even this evening that they'd give their life to you. Have your way, Lord, in this invitation. We pray and ask in Jesus' name.